Don't you hate it when someone tells you what to do and then doesn't tell you how to do it? One of the worst things, you know, those, those speakers who, who throw theory at you, you should do this, we should have supported decision making. And then you say things like, yeah, but what about the teacher? What about this? You know, what do I say? What do I do? Well, that's what this is about. Because I think it's wrong just to tell you what to do and not give you the tools to do it. So the rest of today, for me, is about finding ways to change our culture. To find ways to use the programs that already exist to incorporate supported decision making and maximize self-determination. And it's got to start with a realization. And it starts like this. We all want the same things. We all want the same things out of life. Every person wants the same thing. Every kid wants to be an adult. Every adult wants to live the life that he or she envisions as ideal. Every person wants the job they want, the life they want, the relationships they want. We all want to be the ones who are in control. We all want to be the ones who decide what our life is. And that is just self-determination. There is, I think, no better way of describing self-determination than saying we want to be the ones who determine where we go because it, you know, it feels good in your life. Doesn't it feel good to be the one in charge? Well, we also know for people with disabilities that it is good. It is the key to life and that something like supported decision-making where we empower people, whether within or without a guardianship, and I'm going to tell you now, this is not a separate thing. We don't deal, we should not think of this as supported decision making or guardianship. So I hope I'm going to show you supported decision making is part of everything we do. So if we look at supported decision making as a connective tissue, as I'm going to show you, then we have the chance to use that to empower people to be more self-determined because, and never forget this, you're going to hear it about 20 times, people who are more self-determined are more likely to do well in education, more likely to be employed, and more likely to live independently. That is not arguable. Remember, self-determination equals a higher likelihood of independence, employment, and educational achievements. Maybe that's why it has become so popular. You asked me you know, when this really took root. You know, Post-Jenny, we have seen a, kind of an explosion. Now, SDM has been endorsed by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration on Community Living. We have seen uh, the American Bar Association has been very forward on it. The National Guardianship Association. Interest groups like the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, who I cannot recommend em enough as a resource. They have phenomenal supported decision-making guides. The ARC, the AARP joined me on an amicus brief in Texas arguing for supported decision-making. So, if we can agree, and I still hope we can, that self-determination is a key, and we can agree that that's all of our goals, I want you all to think about something. How'd you get there? How did you get to self-determination in your life? How did you get to where you are? I bet if we went around this room, all of you've got a story. All of you have a person in your life, a moment, a class, a mentor, someone who helped you find yourself, identify what you want to do, write a resume, get a job, advance. And you have to realize something, that for people without disabilities, you are part of a system. You're part of an incredibly effective system. So effective you don't know you're in one, just like you didn't know what your favorite ride is. You've been part of a relatively orderly system where you, you know, grew up, went to school, got your jobs, had your lives, and moved forward. It has moved forward so inexorably that you don't realize you're part of it. That's the beauty of it. Well, for people with disabilities, it's quite different. Because for people without disabilities, remember, you've had teachers and guidance counselors and mentors. You've had opportunities in the community and internships and people in your office to help you grow. Here's what I know from being around the country and talking to people. Here's what I know, as, as my partner pointed out. She said that for people with disabilities, there is no system. There is a dangerous set of circumstances. Because here's the deal, if you've ever worked with a person with disabilities, you know this already. People with disabilities and their families are told to talk to you about education, or you about employment, and you about medical care, and you about money and banking, but here's the problem. You may not know you, or you may not like you, or you may give diametrically opposite opinions than you. You know what happens then? People with disabilities and families spend so much time chasing their tail, mm -hmm. trying to figure out who can help, that they never get a chance 
to access the help and support they need. And when that happens, when they're not able to get what they need, when they're not able to have access to the supports that you have naturally, and they fail or cannot achieve, inevitably that is what leads to guardianship. The system is, as one expert says, fragmented. It does not prepare people for independence. Or as I, we said in one article, the system is siloed. Confession, as someone told me at the break, I sound like I'm from the East Coast. Yes, Long Island, New York, just outside of Queens. Therefore, when Jessalyn Gustin told me that there is a silo system, I said, you know what, that's right. Because to me, a silo is a hole in the ground the rocket comes out of. I said, what a great image. We're going to have a silo system and blast off to independence. And she said, no, dummy. Um, a silo is a big, dark, scary thing. She is from Vermont. A big, dark, scary thing that things go into and don't come out of for many, many years. She said, yeah, that works. <laughs> we do have a silo system, don't we? We ask people to have a silo of education and a silo of employment and a silo of medical care and a silo of legal issues, and they don't communicate. The result of that, as Professors Katsianis, Defer, and Condorman said, is a fragmented system. You want to hear my horror story? This is a true story. I did a presentation in Missouri, and a grandmother called me. She had custody of her grandson. She said, Jonathan, I heard everything you said about guardianship. Um, it's not working for my grandson. I'm going to have to do it. Uh, he's flunking out of school, can't keep a job. There's no way he can live independently. He's going to need to be a guardian. It was like she wanted absolution from me. And, you know, I never tell people whether or not to get guardianship. That is an intensely personal decision. I don't know your grandson. I can't tell you what it is. I just hope you had the information you need to make the best decision. Would you like me to help you? She said, yeah. I said, so who's he getting help from? I said, well, he's in school, so he has an IEP. He's working with vocational rehabilitation. He has an IPE. He is working with Medicaid. He has an ISP. Yeah, I know, it's a lot of initials. Uh, side note, we are in a field that is beset with acronyms, are we not? Uh, I worked for a couple of years with an organization called Self-Help for the Hard of Hearing before I realized that stood for shh. <laughs> so I said, can you send me those plans? And she did. And as you're going to see, and, and the law covers this, Every plan a person has with disabilities essentially covers the same thing. They had to cover education, employment, and independent living. All of them had those sections. And sure enough, all of them, the school, the voc rehab, the Medicaid agency, had all written a plan, all of which had sections for education, employment, and independent living. Three plans, nine goals, none of them matched. You're nodding your head because you know. You've seen it. Well, for this young man, his education goals were everything from GED, maybe, to four-year degree. His employment goals were hand to God sheltered workshop to full-time media technician. His independent living was segregated group home to supported apartment. And I said to that woman, of course he's failing. How can he succeed? Three agencies dedicated to helping him that he trusts are telling him nine different things about his life. He is being failed by the system, and as a result, he is, quote unquote, failing, seen as the failure, he will wind up losing his rights because we can't get our stuff together. And that's the sin. I mean, again, think about it. If you're in this field, you know this already. All these plans and all these organizations are covering the same thing. Centers for Independent Living, Community Work Incentive Coordinators, they all cover the same areas. So ask a really simple question. Why are they in silos? Why at a time when everyone is dealing with decreased budgets? And they can legitimately say, they can cry poverty, as I call it. Why are they still trying to do everything? Why are teachers having to do employment counseling? Why are employment counselors having to do independent living when there's someone else who does it? So the question I have is, why are these entities that already are charged to do the same things, and as you'll see, already charged to work together, why are they not doing it? Why are we in silos? So we need a change. We need a change that is consistent with existing law. I ask for nothing that is not already covered by law. And yet we had to slap a label on it because jars require that. So we're going to get away from a reflexive culture, a culture of separation and silos, and we're going to create a new culture, a culture of coordinated support, a culture where people who are empowered to help people actually do it. And to every lawyer in this room and every professional, I tell you it is a new opportunity for you too.
a new opportunity to actually embrace and experience the change you all went to law school to make. So what's culture coordinated support? There it is. I gave this presentation in Ohio. We're talking about it. And a guy walks up to me and he says, is this what you're talking about? And I said, wow. I said, color that in. <laughs> and I've stolen it ever since. But this is what life should look like. This is what we're talking about. In all situations, the person with disabilities is in the middle. Person-centered planning, right? And I submit right next to that person are the people in this room, the counselors, the attorneys, the visitors, who are there to help that person navigate and access supports and services. Now look what we have here. Look who is around that person. All of those silos, typically. Family and friend and community relationships, schools, employment counselors, DD providers, whoever else. As usual, they are there and they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're talking to her. She's talking back. As you'll see, hopefully they're using supported decision making. But they're receiving information to her and giving it to her and receiving it from her. But here's what's different, is they're talking to each other. They are coordinating with each other instead of being in silos. Wouldn't it be great for a school to say to a vocational rehabilitation, we got education. Can you handle the employment stuff? And why don't we come to the same meeting and talk to the person about it? Because if we do that, if we share information amongst each other, then instead of nine goals over three plans, maybe we have three goals. Maybe we have a shared vision. Maybe we have more communication. And doesn't that lead to more efficiency? If I'm able to do less work, but do it in something I specialize in, means I've just saved my agency money. I've saved my state money. And I can use that money to help more people. That's the culture of coordinated support. Simply saying that the people best situated to help people should actually do it. Let's talk about what I mean. Because opportunities for this are all around us. Everything that you interact with. And again, I say to the people in this room, you interact with more you know, areas of supports and services than anywhere else, you have the ability to bring this together because it's all the same thing. Whether we call it the student-led IEP, informed choice, person-centered planning, uh, plans to achieve self-sufficiency, or anything else, it comes down to the same things. Putting the supports and services in place that people need to succeed. So we start with how we make this happen. And where do we learn to make decisions outside of the home when we're young? School, right? School is the first place where we learn to interact with people. Well, here's what we know about education, an article of faith. We know that students who are more self-determined have better outcomes. Students who are more self-determined are more likely to be educated well, to be employed, and to live independently. Never forget that. Self-determination is the key to education, employment, and independent living. You know why that's important? Because if I ask you guys how we do that with special education, any special education lawyers in the room? Oh, you're missing out. <laughs> in special education, what we know from the Supreme Court is people have a right to receive educational benefits, reasonably calculated to help them succeed. Educational benefits. Lawyers hate the Rowley case. I love the Rowley case. Here's why. Because you ask yourself, what's an educational benefit? You know what? If I asked the people in this room what the point of education, specifically special education, is, you'd all give me some variation on a few different answers. Inclusion, mainstreaming, access to the curriculum. You're all right, but you're also all wrong. Congress tells us what educational benefits are. This is what the IDEA says. This is the whole point of special education, to prepare students for further future education, employment, and independent living. Yes, independent living is a core responsibility of special education. And what do we know leads to those three things? Self-determination. Maybe that's why all these studies cited by the US Department of Education say that the key to education is self-determination, that schools should give kids a chance to solve problems and make decisions. It's where we learn. That is the key to education, employment, and independent living. And yet, as I said before, number one referral source for guardianship, schools, with a bullet. We saw examples of schools with a policy of referring people to guardianship, actually written policy. Or one had a computer program that was designed to help write IEPs in transition, and one of the things you had to click on was guardianship options given. We're not telling kids about parents about independence. We're not fostering education 
employment and independent living. So I say to everyone here, if you're going to advocate, if you're going to work in schools like you do, we shut the on-ramp. Schools are the on-ramp to guardianship because kids or parents are hearing it from like 12, 13, 14. Do you have your guardianship plan in place? Well, if we made self-determination the default option, then what we'd do is we'd ensure this. We would ensure that the people going and being referred to guardianship were only the ones who really needed it. That the culture would be to maximize self-determination rather than recommend guardianship. And we do that by starting early. Remember, IDEA says from day one, education, employment, independent living. DC Public Schools, where I practice, has the first supported decision-making policy, and they are talking supported decision-making in pre-K. I have done presentations with Dr. downing Hostin, and she says, we brag, we got three-year-olds talking about their networks. <laughs> it is funny. I completely admit it's funny. I laugh too. My God, I need supported decision-making between you know, milk and juice. I'm not sure if I want a cookie or a cracker. What does my network have to say? It is funny, except it's not. If you're three and you have disabilities and you have a choice to make and it is made very clear to you that you are the decision maker and made very clear that you can and should seek support from people in your life to make that decision, guess what just happened? You just set a precedent. You've created a habit. And as the decisions get harder, the need for support, the use of support, the expectation of making the decision continues. That's why they say it is on teachers to help people build their networks young and involve parents. Get the parents realizing that it's okay to ask for help, that help is a good thing, and to give and get help so the parents can tell them, it's okay, we can set this up. You know why? Because when parents see it and they're part of it, man, they want it. I talk to parents all the time who are seeking guardianship. You ask any parent what they want for their child, they'll say the same thing. Happy as possible, safe as possible, independent as possible. We talk about ways to make that happen. You know what happens when a parent is involved in this? When a parent sees it? And someone says at 18, are you getting guardianship? That parent gets mad because they've seen what decision making is. So we start early. And by the time they get to transition, they're talking about setting up formal supported decision making processes. They're helping people access their services and supports. And they have, uh, by the end, an agreement people can sign. These are the supporters I want to help me. Even if I'm 18 and now of the age of majority, I still want mom and dad at my class. By the way, if you ever hear a teacher say, you must get guardianship or you can't come to an IEP meeting, it ain't true. The top of every IEP meeting form I've ever seen says, you may bring who you want to this meeting. A supported decision-making plan says, I understand I can bring who I want. I want these people to come with me. And just like that, you set up a supported decision-making network. And that is a chance for us to do something special. I have no idea when my foot was burning. It turns out my flashlight is on. <laughs> so if I was hopping around there, that explains why. So glad that was on camera. Please do edit that. <laughs> but that's what we can do. We can empower from a young age. We can make self-determination a goal, because that's the heart of every individualized education plan, goals and objectives. Now, you've been in plenty of schools. You know that goals and objectives tend to be boring. They tend to be reactive. The student shall decrease the number of times she is late by 50%. The student will use proper grammar 75% of the time. Laying aside that ain't possible, it doesn't help anything. What we talk about, and again, a best practice, is student direct involvement in creating goals. We talk about I statements, again, not me, USDOE. You know what an I statement is? It's a statement of a goal where the student actually takes part. Not the student shall not be late. I, I will work with my teacher to develop a plan to ensure I am on time 50% or more. That meets every requirement for an IEP, but look what it did. I. I have to do it. I must be self-determined. We'll work with my teacher. I must get support. Without ever using the phrases, we have encouraged self-determination, the key to education, employment, and independent living, and incorporated support in decision-making. I must work with my teacher. You know another reason why that's important? If you get a goal that says decrease the number of times you're late, you know what happens if you don't? You failed. You flunked that objective. I will develop a plan. It doesn't work. Develop a new one. That's a real-world skill right there, isn't it? 
You are empowering kids to take those steps. And we have the now the other best practice, the student-led IEP that you can advocate for or work for. Right now, IEP meetings, ask any parent or ask any kid, are kind of scary things. They're surrounded. They feel like they're being told what to do. Well, U.S. Department of Education talks about the student-led IEP. Student-led IEP is supposed to be essentially a board of directors meeting. I tell parents, get your kids to the IEP meeting as early as possible. Three years old, a three-year-old can say, my name is. A five-year-old can say, I like to do this. A seven-year-old can talk about their favorite subjects. And on and on and on. The goal is for the student to lead the team. So that eventually what happens is they're working together. The student is receiving information from the parents and the counselors and the teachers. And together they're developing an IEP, hopefully with I statements. They have goals and objectives in that IEP with the goal of that student saying, Thank you for that, I agree, and signing off. The teachers and the administrators and the professionals and the counselors giving information, the student agreeing to it. Doesn't that sound like supported decision making? The student-led IEP is just supported decision making. Well, why, you know, when we talk about schools as being the on-ramp to guardianship, the question is often why. And I always wonder, why are we still doing this? We mean well and all that. Well, I finally found an article that I think nails it. Guardianship happens when people can't, quote unquote, take care of themselves in a way that society deems is appropriate. In other words, they need education, employment, independent living. But where in school can we learn those skills? And I gotta tell you, it's called transition. You were talking about transition coordinators lately. Transition is a place that is my favorite part of education. It is a place that is rife for advocacy and representation because in my opinion, nobody does it. No one does it and I feel sorry for schools because they really can't do it. It's a part of the presentation. There's no school that can do all the things that Congress has heaped upon them. It's not an excuse, it's just a reality. I mean, take a look at what transition services are. First, please note coordinated set of services, coordination. But look at what schools have to do. They have got to facilitate the child's movement from school to post school, including education, employment, and independent living. They have got to provide services like instruction, services, community experiences, employment, post-school adult living objectives, acquisition of daily living skills. All of those things are the requirement in transition. I ask you a question, what's a more important independent living skill or daily living skill than decision making? But look at those words and note what it comes down to. Education, employment, and independent living in transition services, and yet, Number one referral source for guardianship are schools. This is where I legitimately get angry. So before I sympathize with schools, let me get angry at them first. When a school tells a parent, your child is turning 18, you must get guardianship, and the parent comes to me, what I ask the parent to do is, let me see the last three IEPs. Let me see the transition IEPs. Here's why. If that school feels that that kid can't make decisions or needs a guardian, well, damn it, that better have shown up in a transition plan as an independent living deficit. And there better be independent living goals. And there better be daily living skill goals in there. If there isn't, I recommend they lawyer up. And lawyers in the room, special education cases have fees. To me, that's the purest form of a violation of Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. To have a clear obligation to ensure independent living and employment and other skills and then not to address them and just say get guardianship. That's the on-ramp that must close. Now, let me sympathize for schools. Who the heck can get this done? You know, again, I had a parent say to me, the school is doing employment training with my kid. What they do is they put all the kids on the bus and they go to the supermarket to bag groceries. My kid doesn't want to bag groceries. Are they violating his rights? I said, yep, but I feel bad for him. Because that's not what they're there for. Schools didn't get in this. Teachers didn't get in it to be employment counselors. They didn't get in it to do employment independent living. They didn't get in it to do that at a time of decreasing budgets. Who the hell has time to do it? As one teacher told me, we can serve one child perfectly. Get beyond that and it's awful hard. Not an excuse but an explanation. Well, here's the thing about transition. You got at least five years of it. Some states start at age 14. So you've got those five years, not a snapshot in time, not an 18 and out in time. You have potentially five years to put all that stuff together, to make this happen, to again, I say, coordinate efforts, to get community experiences and adult living objectives, to get education, employment, independent living, to incorporate supported decision-making and self-determination because that is what? The key to education, employment, independent living. So with that in mind that no one it's awfully hard to do all that. What can we do to make it happen? 
Well, just like every person here needs help in their lives, schools need help too. And that's what all of these providers should do, is find help. By the way, if now we're dealing with adults and not kids, take out schools, substitute something like a Center for Independent Living, substitute an Aging and Disability Resource Center. I use kids because we're following, we're tracing the life course. Well, what's the next thing we have after school generally? Work. And work is one of the areas where we can provide the most support and we can provide the most coordination. Let me introduce you to vocational rehabilitation. Anybody know VR? Vocational rehabilitation, my favorite program for people with, with disabilities. Why? Because VR is all about work. In the law, if you need something to prepare for, secure, retain, advance, or regain, get ready to work, get a job, keep a job, advance the job, get a job back. Anything related to that is covered by VR. Well, ask yourself this. What if the, what are the, same, what if the same things? What if the same things, the same problems that are stopping you from working are also stopping you from living independently? What if the same things, the same lack of employment skills are stopping you from getting uh, your independent living, driving you to guardianship? And I mean employment skills, like taking care of yourself, like organization, like caring for your health, communicating with others. If that's stopping you from working, those are VR covered. I've had litigation on this, and I've had VR say, oh no, those are independent living skills. That's self-care, that organization, that's school stuff. That's Center for Independent Living stuff. Those are unemployment skills. Well, let me ask you this, as I asked them on the stand. Would you hire somebody who can't get along with your customers? Would you retain someone who has such poor self-care skills, they're always getting sick and getting other people sick? Would you promote someone who's so disorganized they can't follow your policies? If the answer to those questions are all no, and you know that they are, then guess what? Those are employment skills. So here's the thing about VR. What we know, what we must know, is if a person has life skills limitations that prevent them from working, VR must cover it. What that means is now VR is a conduit to independent living and employment. And it's easy to be eligible. Again, I'm speaking right to the advocates and attorneys in this room. VR is the easy, in special ed, you gotta have fit a category. Medicaid, you gotta have financials. VR, here's how you get eligible. Need to have a disability, need to want to work, and that disability has to impact your ability to work, make it harder to work. You got those three things, you are eligible. In fact, if you're on public benefits, SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, you are presumed eligible. Man, it is hard to be ineligible. They have to prove that you can't work. They can't just say, you can't work. I stand before you saying I have never lost a VR case. Not because I'm a genius, but because I can read. Here's what the law says. If they think you are too disabled to work, they have to give you a chance to work. They have to put you to work. I had a case once with a kid with a measured IQ, don't get me started on IQ, of 39. VR said he can't work, not with an IQ like that. So I brought in his IEP, which talked about his volunteer work. Not a genius, but I can read. So it is hard. Hard to be ineligible. One representative of the federal government told me about 99.7% of people should be found eligible for VR. And that's why I'm giving you code sites. Because also, the same way that special ed carries fees, so do VR cases. And this is a place that is crying out for advocacy because of all the good that it can do. Because once you're eligible, you get a plan. Just like an IEP in education, the individualized plan for employment is what you get in voc rehab. The whole point of the IPE is to list the job the person is going for and the supports and services he or she needs to get there. Note that I said the job the person chooses because that is the other thing I hear about VR in many places. I'm not speaking about Idaho, as I haven't worked with that VR, but we hear in VR, we, people get pushed into what we call F jobs. Food, filth, flowers, filing. You know, it's like you're a person with disabilities, so fast food is right, light retail, light secretarial, and janitorial. We see it all the time. No, that's not the point of VR. VR, the whole point is for the person to identify what he or she wants and the supports and services they need. And here is an awesome list in tiny language, because there's so many of it, of all of, of some of, not all of, some of the things VR can do. 34 CFR 361.48, my favorite reg, geek. 34 CFR 361.48, it's great, work the mnemonic, has a list of 21 things VR must provide if a person needs them to work. Let's take a look and see if they look familiar to you. Look what I see. 
education, employment services, independent living services. I usually, when I do this presentation, I say, quick, name me something that keeps people with disabilities from working. Anyone? I'm starting the clock in my head till someone says transportation. <laughs> Why, look, it's right there. If someone needs transportation to work or prepare to work, it's a VR-required service. Now look at what's here. Look at what's here. Medical care, independent living, service to families, education. Doesn't that look like, a lot like, what's required in transition services? And by the way, I lied to you. It's not 21. It's 22. Number 22 is anything else a person needs to work. So you have the ability to tie things to employment legitimately and logically, and have them get covered. Now, if schools and VR are working together as they're supposed to, we have a chance to really build something. Remember the student-led IEP is just supported decision making? In VR, they have to do what's called informed choice. Informed choice up on the screen, statutorily defined. Informed choice works like this. You're my counselor. Your job, counselor, is to give me information based upon what you know I'm good at, your sports, your skills, an evaluation. You can tell me what jobs are out there. You can advise me what I might do well at, and you can let me know what supports and services are available. Whole point of that is you give me the advice I need. I choose my job goal. I choose my supports and services. You advise and inform. I decide, does that not sound like supported decision making? So now we have schools and we have VR doing essentially the same thing in essentially the same way. Why aren't they working together? In fact, they're required to work together. There's a federal law called WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, that said to VR, we're going to fund you even more money than you get now, but you've got to put more focus on young adults. And in fact, there's a regulation been around for decades. VR must become involved in special education as early as possible. They're already required to coordinate. Keep my promises. I'm not telling you anything that's not already required by law. So if they do that, if they do what they're supposed to do, imagine a school can say, we don't want to do employment. It's not what we're good at. We're teachers. And VR can say, we don't want to do teaching. It's not what we're good at. We're going to do employment. So school, you cover in-school stuff. Maybe you cover community experiences and some independent living. We're going to get employment and mentorships and independent skills when it comes to employment. And we're going to work together, like the law says we're supposed to, and develop some joint goals. And then we can figure out who does things best. And just like that, you've complied with the law and empowered people to live independently. And it gets better than that, because it's not just school and work that define life, it's also living in the community. It's having health care. Anybody here hear about person-centered planning? Don't get me started. But person-centered planners I feel even worse for than schools in VR. Person-centered planning is anything covered by Medicaid. Waivers, Centers for Independent Living, Medicare, Medicaid, they're all required to do person-centered planning. This comes directly from the feds on what person-centered planning is, and this is why I feel even worse for them than I do for schools. Look at what person-centered planners have to do. They've got to provide services in Community participation, employment, income and saving, health care and wellness, education, and oh, by the way, others. <laughs> but look, where have we seen this language before? Education, employment, health care, independent living. We are once again covering the same ground. We are once again covering the same ground. And by the way, federal law also says that VR agencies must attend IEP meetings and person-centered planning meetings if they are invited you have a mechanism to bring them together. So how does the person-centered planner supposed to do that? Well, they've all been trained in person-centered planning, and I can tell you, I've been to this training. Person-centered planning is all about finding out what's important to the person and for the person. Helping the person understand where he or she is now, where they want to go, who they want in their lives, and what they need to empower them to live independently as possible, as well as possible. They get advice from their counselors. They choose their providers and supports and services. Doesn't that sound like supported decision-making? We speak the same language. Supported decision making is the through line through life. It's not just supports and services. It's things that we can do to incorporate it and empower it in where we are. And here's one of my favorite ways to do it. If you're an attorney, if you're someone who works with them, the power of attorney is my favorite tool for supported decision making. I tell people this all the time. Guardianship, you're inviting the court in your life for the rest of your life. That may or may not be a good thing. 
But what it is is a proscriptive thing. The court is going to decide how we do things. With a POA, we can shape it. We can say, the whole point of a POA is for me to say, if I can't make decisions, please do it for me. But we can also say, here's how you're going to do it. I've written POAs that actually say, here is a list of decisions that you will adhere by whether I'm in charge or not. I am a person who is allergic to this medication. Don't give me that. I am a person with mental illness. I do not want Haldol. I never consent to seclusion and restraint. That's appropriate. We can put into a POA, there are certain values I have. Here they are listed. You are charged to make decisions consistent with those values. If it's a decision, I, I, and the first thing you have to do is consult me on the decision. We can put that into a POA. You know, this is my, steal my language. This is language I've used. Look at it. We can say, I'm giving you power. This is a durable power of attorney. I'm giving you power, agent, but here's how you're going to exercise it. You're going to talk to me first. You're going to give primary consideration to my express wishes before you make any decision. And just like that, we've maximized the person's self-determination. We've created supported decision making. We can do it in the medical field. A medical advanced directive just says, God forbid something happens to me and I can't make medical decisions. I want you to make them for me. And you should all have those. We should be able to say, if I get into an accident and I can't make decisions, I want my, my wife to do it for me. I'm very sorry about that. But who better? Who better to make decisions? My wife, my mother, my brother, the person who knows me. Well, we can put that into writing too. Again, steal my language. We can say, should something happen to me, you make decisions consistent with these values. In the meantime, while I'm not incapacitated, I want you to make decisions with me. At times when you don't have full power, what you're going to do is you're going to support me. I am deputizing you to come to the doctor with me to help me get the information I need to make my decisions. And if we throw a HIPAA waiver in there, we have just created a legally enforceable supported decision-making agreement. We have created a supported decision-making team. I can bring a copy. I tell people to PDF it on their phones. But I can give a copy to my doctor and say, left front flap of my file, so you know every time I'm coming in, this person's coming with me. We can shape supported decision making. We can do it in finances. After safety, financial fear of exploitation is the number one reason I hear for guardianship. And it's a darn good reason. People can be swindled. But we can still create ways to maximize self-determination while also providing protection. The language up here comes from a case I had where a mom saw me present and said she was on the cusp of seeking guardianship for his son. Her son was on, the on uh, an autism spectrum disorder, and she was afraid he couldn't handle money. He might get swindled. And by the way, self-possessed kid, 18 years old, said, yeah, you know what? I could get swindled. I I maybe I need this protection. Side note, by the way, we're making these judgments based on 18-year-olds. Anybody here at 18 ready to handle their money wisely? <laughs> Please do not follow me on Facebook. People will occasionally paste a prom picture or my car in high school, and you will say that boy needed a guardian. <laughs> for wardrobe, at least. But this is what we determined. We came up with a way for protection and self-determination to go hand in hand. What we said is, hey, kid, you're on an allowance. Up to 100 bucks or 200 bucks. Go wild, spend, learn, make bad decisions. That's how we do things. Anything more than that, mom's got to sign off on. So if you want to buy a car for 20 grand, mom's got to okay it. But here's how mom does. Mom can't just say yes or no. They have to have a conversation. She's got to talk to him. And before she makes a decision, she must give primary consideration to his express wishes. Why? One, he might be right. Two, he might not be right. And it gives her a chance to provide education, to talk about budgeting, to talk about decision making. Because that was the goal of this POA, to maximize independence, as everyone should be the goal. That's the goal of guardianship we saw from your law. We did that with banking. We said, write checks, withdraw. And now with technology, we can put withdrawal limits on accounts. We can say requires two OKs. So that's what we did. We said anything more than 100 bucks, put it on the check, requires two signatures. We've seen that in businesses forever. We've all seen it, two signatures if above a certain amount. So we did this in the POA. We went to the bank and said, we want double signed checks that say above this. The bank said, we don't do that for individuals. We said, these individuals are getting a new bank. Shockingly, it worked out. <laughs> but just the same way, if you want to withdraw more than that, you got to talk to mom. And mom just can't rubber stamp a veto. She's got to talk to him. Because the whole hope here is that he will learn from making bad choices like we do. And he'll be empowered to do better with it. And every POA, including that one I have, has a growth clause. 
Yes, I know service plans are required to have annual reviews. I mean a real review. We call it a growth clause because the whole goal for that young man was for him to get better, was for him to increase skills. So every year we're going to do a real deep dive in here. Maybe he's gotten good enough that we can make that a $500 limit. Maybe no limit. That was our goal, five years, no limits. But you know what? Maybe he could have gotten worse and we had to tighten it up and put in new procedures. Even then, that's a good thing. I can show you studies if you work with older adults. There's a study that says older adults more involved in their care, even ones in cognitive decline, have better qualities of life and are better able to adjust to increasing care needs because they're involved. So what a great way. I, I do lectures with a guy named David Godfrey from American Bar Association. He talks about his mom. His mom had dementia. But he kept her involved by, you know, this is how we do finances, setting limits on spending. She had self-determination to the maximum of her abilities, and he will tell you, and I would tell you the science agrees, her life was better for it. She had the protection, but she also had the self-determination. Supported decision-making traces a line all through life. We've just gone from pre-K, and now it's time to have a happy talk about death. <laughs> because end-of-life planning is critical. If you haven't done it, you should. When I was doing a lot of work with an agency in, in DC, person-centered planning requires having end-of-life discussion. No one would do it. Why? Because it feels icky. That's what I'm hearing. It's just it, no one wants to talk about their death. Newsflash. Yeah, they do. You know, because, uh, happy thought, the darkness is coming for all of us, we don't have control over that, but we have control over how. So there are, there are systems out there, five wishes, the conversation. It's a guided conversation to help people talk about, do they want extraordinary measures? If they die, what kind of services they want? What music they want? What they want and where they want to spend their last days? That's just supported decision making. So we have ways, and people say, well, what does that matter? It matters. Having that control over something that is inherently uncontrollable means just for one sec, you get a little more self-determination in your life. And that means your life is better. So here's what I say, people, advocates, attorneys. We need to bring this together. I hope I have shown you that supported decision-making is not a guardianship or no guardianship thing. It is part of life. It is part of everything we do. Therefore, we should be using it to coordinate opportunities. We should be using it to represent our clients. We should be using it when we talk to families about how to do it. Bring it together. I'm not talking about new plans. God forbid there should be new plans. God forbid there should be more meetings. No, if we do this right, less meetings. If we get, for example, for a kid in, in special ed and transition, if we got VR, a DD agency in the school in one room for one meeting, and I am told constantly the hardest part is getting people together, finding the parent to track down for the schedule. Now we don't have to schedule three times, just one. And now we talk together. We have the conversation. And from those conversations, we can create joint goals. At which point, the only question is, who's going to do it? Who's best situated? Now we're effective. Now we are efficient. I just, I mean, you have to, again, we have to put labels on jars. But you, know, you can call it a coordinated support plan if you want. But really, it's just a plan. It's the same way we all make plans. I'll give you a great example. I would like, really, to talk to you. But dang it, there's something in my way. I'm not stealing your purse. There's something in my way stopping me from talking to you. What do I do? Ma'am, could you move that, please? Please? <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. Sorry about that. <laughs> Look what we did. Is that not the essence of planning? What is my goal? What's stopping me from getting there? Who can help me do it? That's what a coordinated support plan is. We can talk to the people in our lives about what they want in areas of their life, education, employment, independent living, finances, medical care. What is it that you see yourself wanting? It's a conversation we all have internally every day. And if we come to the realization that people with disabilities do too, we empower that conversation. The next question is, what's stopping you from getting there? And the next question from that is, who can help me? As we've seen, it's multiple entities. But if we're working together, the better question is which one of us is going to help. And then we can create a joint plan. We can create those three plans out of that one conversation and attach it to all the other things we do. You know, I, I hear all the time, I hear complaints about people in the disability service field because of their kind of accountability measures like uh, the settings rule. The settings rule is a scary thing because we have, we have reduced the question of self-determination into a series of essentially yes or no questions like, 
Do you have meaningful opportunities to exercise choice in your day-to-day -day life with regard to employment? You ask me that, you know what I say? <laughs> Do you have meaningful opportunities to exercise choice in your day-to-day -day life with regard to your day-to-day -day activities? Sometimes. But if we do this, imagine how well we can answer that question. Imagine how well an advocate or attorney could say, you know, I'm holding your plan. And it says that you've got a job goal of being a computer technician and you're working with Jonathan on that. How's it going? You know, is there anything more that you need that I could help with that we could put things in place to make that easier to happen? And just like that, you've answered the question. The rule requires, and you've gone a step further and actually helped people. The person I work with in Vermont, the one who called me a dummy about silos, has, can, can bring this down to the easiest brass tacks. Do what makes you proud. All the paperwork we have to do, all of the regulations, you got into this for a completely different reason. If you are in this field, you get into this for that feeling when you empower someone to have their life. Do what makes you proud. Find the ways to make you proud. And I'm not, once again, don't look at me like a hippie. The things I do are supported by science. Project Renew has been replicated across the country. Project Renew works with the so-called worst of the worst, the at-risk kids. The point of Project Renew, it's not as broad as what I'm talking about here, but it was to empower kids to receive coordination of supports and services around things like education, employment, independent living, to empower them to set their own plans, and when things don't work, to reconfigure them. Well, one, the first time it was done, one year in, one year in, the worst of the worst, 93% were working. Almost two-thirds had kept their jobs. Two years after the program, almost 100% were either graduating high school or on track, two uh, three-quarters in college, 83% found and kept employment. It works. Why? Because it ain't rocket science. Self-determination leads to education, employment, and independent living, and it's happening. You said before, when is this worm turned? Well, post-hatch, we now see laws in Texas, Delaware, Wisconsin, Tennessee, D.C. I didn't get Missouri because they only just did it. They're all Tennessee. They're passing laws that either recognize supported decision-making, encourage it, or make it easier to get there. The federal government funded the National Resource Center on Supported Decision Making, which I'm the co-project director of, www.supporteddecisionmaking.org. Please make use of it. And we see projects all over the country. I'm facilitating SDM pilot projects in multiple states, all dedicated to that proposition. Self-determination leads to better life. It leads to only people who truly need guardianship being in guardianship. Vermont is the first state to actually create a comprehensive task force to make this happen. I was invited to facilitate their first meeting. Every agency that works with older adults and people with disabilities were there. You know how I convinced them that they had to do this? I gave them a hypothetical. I said, how would your agency help this person? Then I said, trick question. How would the agency represented by the person, three people to your right, help that person? Nobody knew. They didn't know. The left and the right hands weren't acquainted. That's why you have to work together. And now there are projects in Vermont with people who've never worked together before. Schools and self-advocates and VR and legal aid are teaming up to identify kids at risk of guardianship, put supports and services in place so they get what they need from whatever source. Then the legal aid attorneys are writing powers of attorney that enshrine those rights. We have DD agencies who serve people under guardianship working with the public guardian to identify people who, with appropriate supports, could emerge from guardianships, and we've seen people get out. It's happening around the country in a little town called Pickaway, Ohio. Pickaway has created the first what we call successful transition project, where they brought together, just like I said, school, VR, DD agency. Identify those kids at risk, put supports in place so that their school supports echo and are consistent with their VR and Medicaid supports. Three plans, one meeting. Saving time, saving money. We gotta fin and this is how I wanna finish. Hope I've shown you that we can make great things happen. We can empower people. We can increase self-determination. But it only happens if we get in the right head space. If we start by saying 2,500 years of culture is too much, 
It's time to go from you must get a guardian because of X to you will only get a guardian if you cannot truly do that. That means we must respect, protect, and recognize everyone's right to make choices, that most basic right. If we do that, and you do that, and you advocate for that, and God, I hope you will, you're going to get the same thing I get. You will get what I call the finger wag. I am a big old recipient of the finger wag. You know, when you ask them to do something, they wag their finger and they say, don't you know you're asking us to change the way we've always done things? Don't you know we have a way? It is the Virginia way. It is the Idaho way. This is the way we do it, and you're asking us to change? Well, if you buy into what I said, what I'm hoping is that you'll answer this question the same way I do. And if you remember nothing else I say, remember this. When that finger wags and they say, don't you know you're asking us to change the way we've always done things, your answer to that question is yes. Also acceptable is damn Skippy. <laughs> Everything we've ever done in this country that has led to our country being better has changed the way we have always done things fundamentally. In 1774, America was always the possession of foreign countries, England, France, Spain, whatever. We changed it. 1863, where I live in Virginia, some people could own other people. We changed it. In 1918, more than half of the population was not allowed to vote. We changed it. In 1989, people with disabilities were not considered in a legal sense people. Changed it. Everything we've done to be better, stronger, and smarter as a nation and as a people has fundamentally changed the way things have always been. And yes, I know change is hard. 2,500 years of culture will push back. You know why? Because when we empower people to make decisions, that's a risk they're going to make bad ones. And when a person makes a bad decision, the finger will wag. See, in guardianship, that wouldn't have happened. That person wouldn't have met that person or done that person or bought that thing. And you know deep in your hearts that's not true because you all make that choice as well. But we've got to go farther than that. We have got to realize that we cannot condition the right to make choices on only making good choices, on only making logical choices. We cannot hold people to the Spock standard. You know why? Because if we do, you got to hold yourself to it. And if the right to make choices is conditioned on only making choices in your best interest, I sure as hell hope you don't drink beer or eat donuts or lie in the sun or blow off work from time to time because that's not in your best interest. Except it is. It's what makes you who you are. You want a personal example? You are looking at, and I will never get tired of saying this, you are looking at the 2018 Martin Luther King commemorative address speaker at Vanderbilt University. Thank you. Jonathan Martinez in the same sentence as Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr., who gave the greatest speech of all time in front of the reflecting pool by the Lincoln Memorial. And Jonathan Martinez, who has more than once jumped into the reflecting pool on a drunken dare. <laughs> Making bad decisions does not mean we cannot make decisions. Making risky decisions does not mean we cannot make decisions. In fact, I would argue that risky decisions teach us what safe ones are, and yet, it will push back. They will tell it has to happen. And you have got to be willing to get up when you've been knocked down. My favorite author nails this one. It's not easy what we do. No one here got into their jobs because it's easy. Law, disability advocacy, being professionals, it ain't easy. But the purpose of life, the purpose of what we do is not to make things easy. We were not promised that things would be easy. The purpose of life is not ease. The purpose of life is to choose and act upon our choices. When we do that, when we empower choice, when we give people opportunities to exercise the same rights that we do, you know how we're judged? Not on that one bad choice. So that's, that's a tough standard. We're judged on three things, our daring, our effort, and our resolve. What have we done to empower people? What have we done professionally? Because what we do requires that. You've got to be bold, you've got to work hard, and you've got to get up seven times and you've been knocked down six. Because the fingers will wag, the tongues will wag, but you know better. If I have given you nothing, I have given you science and case law you can cite. I have given you the very nature of what these agencies are supposed to do. You have the power to empower choice, to give people those same opportunities. You do that, you change the world. It's a cliche, but you change the world for every person you help. And I'll, I'll finish it this way. Think this way. School ends. Employment ends. Healthcare ends. So what you're left with is a system. You're left not with people with disabilities, but people who have to live their life in the real world. And if you've bought into what I said, 
then empower them to live in the real world the same as you do. If you have not bought into what I said, I just kind of hope you die suddenly. <laughs> Hear me out. That is not a threat. <laughs> Hear me out. <laughs> because if you're lucky enough to die suddenly, you're just dead. But if you don't die suddenly, guess what? Someday, you will be considered a person with disability, aged or infirm. You will need someone to help you. You will be in the system. What kind of system do you want? You want one that empowers you? You want one that respects you? Or do you want one that treats you like a non-person that subjects you to civil death? If the answer is what I think it is, then let's change the world. I'd love to do it with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.